Hi, I'm Pete, and welcome to Just a Few Acres Farm. Today's job is to work on cleaning out the barn here for the piglets which are moving in for the winter, and it's a huge job, so I'm taking a little bit at a time. But while I do this job, I thought that I would talk to you all about the economics of a small farm, sort of how we started, how we make a living off it. Now our farm is an awfully small farm in the big scheme of things. We're surrounded by large dairy farms and crop farms here in upstate New York and we're just a 45 acre livestock farm. So how do we do it? I'm going to cover that as I move this lumber. As I finish up my coffee here and get ready to move this pile of lumber onto the wagon and then up to the upper barn where I can store it out of the way, I'd like to ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. It means a lot to us every day when we get one or even two subscribers to our channel. And our mission is to show others how they can make a living off of a small farm in this day and age when it seems like bigger is always better. That you too can make a difference by getting your own piece of land and raising livestock or vegetables and selling it to your local community. It makes your food supply meaningful. It connects people to place. And we're doing that and we want to show others how to do that too. So please like this video. Please subscribe to our channel. Please tell others about our channel. And with you, we can grow it. I guess I should start at the beginning sort of the statistics about our farm. We're a 45 acre farm and we're located in upstate New York. The summers here tend to be hot and humid. The winters are cold and snowy. We get about 150 snow inches of snow every winter. I grew up on the farm. I'm a seventh generation farmer. This land's been in my family since 1804 and my grandfather lived in the house that we live in now when I was growing up. In 1995 Hillary and I moved back to this place and the house was a wreck. So we spent 10 years fixing it up. I was working as an architect and Hillary was working as a registered nurse and in 2013 I decided to leave my job and start the farm and so we had kind of a blank slate. The f house was fixed up and this big barn was here but really nothing else in terms of farm infrastructure. We had a clear idea of what we wanted to do when we started out. We wanted to have a livestock farm because I was familiar with raising livestock and uh, I was never any good at growing vegetables. Our garden sort of half survives. Planning is key to starting and maintaining a farm and you have to be good with numbers and that gets overlooked a lot I think. What we did in the first year is we called that our test year. We started growing chickens and pigs and turkeys and brought the first cattle on the farm. And what I did the first year, and I still continue to do this, is I kept very careful financial records of all the money that went out and all the money that came in and put them all on spreadsheets. So at the end of that first summer, I knew exactly how much it cost us to grow a meat chicken. I knew how much we could sell it for. I knew what the profit was. I knew what the labor inputs w were for, for the chicken. And I knew this for every single animal we were raising. Now once I knew that, it was pretty simple to lay that out on a spreadsheet and say, okay, if we need X amount of income per year as a family, we need to raise this many chickens, this many turkeys, sell this many eggs, send this many beefs to market and it was all laid out there. So in the first year we had our ultimate business goal. This was the sustainable model for our farm. Now the other thing that we found key to starting a farm is setting up working capital. 
and we did it this way. That first year, every time I spent money for the farm, I took it out of our savings. If I had to buy feed or buy lumber or buy a piece of equipment, it all came out of my personal savings. Whenever money came in from selling chickens or what have you, it went into a separate bank account and that became the farm working capital account. So at the end of that year, I had a chunk of money that was the farm's money. And from that point on, our personal finances were kept completely separate from the farm finances. So the next spring, which is the time of year when we lay out the most money to buy chicks and feed and all the other things to get the farm up and running for the year, I had that seed money. Since then, the farm's bootstrapped its own growth through that seed money. So every year that account's grown. And starting in year three, we could start taking money out of that farm account for our living expenses. This is the way that we did it, and frankly, I can't see another way to do it. It takes so much capital to get a farm up and running. And it's really capital intensive in the starting phases where you've got to build fencing and buy livestock and all those things. So we never planned on making a profit in the first three to five years. We planned on putting all that money back into the farm to grow it. I've never been able to figure out how somebody that's just starting say right out of college and doesn't have any savings can ever start a farm because uh, you need to keep a farm as a second job or you, you need income from some place to generate that capital that you need to start the operation. I guess you could go out and borrow it and we didn't borrow any money but the but the the the, the load of that debt on the farm operation drags it down. I mean, plus you're paying interest on it. So that would be a really tense situation for me to have to worry about paying the bank every month as well as making ends meet on the farm and feeding my family. We're not in that situation. We don't have any debt. There's an order to my madness here. All this dimensional lumber will go on one area, plywood in another, small scraps in another. That way if I have a project where I need to access it, I don't have to dig through the whole pile to find what I need. There's some pretty simple but not always easy to follow principles about how you hand your handle your money on a small farm. And the first of those is, you gotta cut way down on your living expenses. We cut our living expenses by two thirds in the first year of our farming. We dropped the satellite TV bill. We cut down on our gasoline because I wasn't commuting. Heck, I used to spend $10 a day just going out to lunch at my old job. Now lunch is leftovers. We thought it would be hard at first to do those cuts, but we don't even notice them now. We're just, we just adjusted our lifestyle to this way and it works. There's so many other things to do besides watching TV around here anyway. The second financial principle is that unlike the dairy farms and the crop farms that we're surrounded by, we have to sell directly to the consumer. Our farm is about growing products and selling them to our community. People that live within probably 30 miles of our farm, that's where all of our products go. We don't ship any products. We don't sell any products to restaurants or any wholesale business at all because it cuts down on our profit margin. That direct-to-consumer model 
is one aspect of really a three-part equation. Number one, selling directly to the consumers. Number two, we have to sell at a premium price because the money just isn't there if I sell my products at the same price that Walmart or Wegmans sells groceries. I can't make a living. Going along with that second principle is a third principle that I need to grow a premium product. I can't justify to myself selling things at a premium price if they aren't any better than the products that people can get at the grocery store. To do that, we raise all of our livestock on pasture. It creates a big difference in the meat and people try it and immediately they recognize that this is something that's worth the money. The other aspect of growing a premium product is we grow heritage breeds. So uh, a lot of that flavor comes from the breeding of the animal. Continuing the theme of reducing our living expenses, we also had to look at the other side too and make sure that our, th our farm is a thrifty operation. There's a couple of ways that we do that. Number one, we don't buy any new equipment. All the tractors and the equipment that you see around here, they're old. And when I bought them at auction, s some pieces were practically junk. Um, there's kind of pride in mechanical know-how that we have, knowing how to fix things up, knowing how to repair things when they break down and getting equipment really cheap. It's a little frustrating sometimes when you have to spend time working on equipment when you're in the middle of something. So the way I go about it is I buy a piece of equipment, I use it for a year or two years, fix what needs to be fixed during that time, then I have a really good idea of how that piece of machinery works and I can make a decision either to go all the way through it, sort of fully restore it, so that's reliable from then on. Or I can move on to say, well, that piece of equipment really wasn't a good investment. Buy another one. And I'm really not down that much money because I'm buying things, what I like to call, quote, fully depreciated. They're really cheap. The second piece of that reducing farm expenses thing is you have to learn to do things yourself, not only mechanically, but when it comes to building fences, building buildings, you know, housing for the, for the animals, building what we call pasture furniture, which is the, all the accommodations for the animals as they move around the pasture. You gotta do that all yourself. If you pay a mechanic or a carpenter, you're not gonna, you're not gonna make a living as a small farmer. All that money's going out. You have to do it yourself. So those two things, buying old equipment and doing all of your building and maintaining yourself, are what I feel one of the most important aspects to keeping a small farm sustainable to make a living for a family off of it. The final principle that we operate on is we have to be creative with the use of our land. We can't afford to waste any square inch of the property we have. We have 30 acres that's dedicated to pasture and I have to be able to move all the animals to any place on that acreage that I need to. It's not like I can grow 20 acres of corn and pasture the animals on 10 acres. So all of our infrastructure is adaptable and portable. We use simple fencing that can be uh, taken up and repositioned if needed. It's just T-posts. And we use a lot of mobile uh, livestock housing so that all of our fields are multi-purpose. The biggest effect of that is that I can make hay off of any of those fields in any given year and hay is a really important aspect of having a livestock farm here in upstate New York where the winters are long and cold and as soon as spring starts we're thinking about how we're going to feed the animals for the next summer. Similarly as soon as fall starts we're thinking about how we're going to heat ourselves for the year after this winter and we start cutting firewood. So we have to plan ahead and we have to be ready to adapt things to changing conditions. Now I have to move these old family heirlooms into the upper barn too. We can't part with them, they're part of history. You know, farming is a tough life. 
making ends meet is a real challenge and it's seven day per week work pretty much year round although our winters are a little easier than our summers and mostly it's hard physical labor I'm a little over 50 and well 51 and my wife is approaching 50 and you know sometimes I wonder how we can keep this up but the idea is to get everything set up here so that it's easier for us to do as we get older right we do all the hard work all the building when we're young and then the farm is easier to take care of as we get older so farming is so difficult and small farming is especially difficult why bother I mean I could have had a good income at a five day a week job and been there and probably retired early well you have to love it as I said and the thing I love about it is I'm I'm so connected to this place um, I just love that sense of belonging my family's been here for 200 years we're raising our kids here and raising kids on a farm I can't think of a better way to raise kids their experience is so varied on a farm they see things growing they experience the seasons they understand differently from our modern world that life changes as you move the seasons there's certain things you do in spring summer fall winter it's so rewarding that way it makes you feel like you're doing or you're living the way people were meant to live in sync with nature and nature's rhythms lots more reasons I enjoy farming <laughs> I don't miss the commute at all I love walking out my back door and right there's my job now the consequence of that is my job never leaves me but I don't mind because I'm I'm still in our seventh year here excited about what the next day has to bring and the work that needs to be done oh. but I have to tell you I didn't really enjoy lifting that heavy cream separator The other great thing about the way we farm is we're not affected by commodity prices. I read the terrible news that dairy farmers and crop farmers are going through in the U.S. these days with the trade wars and the falling price of commodities. And I'd probably be pulling my hair out if I had to worry about forces that I can't control. We can control our destiny. Our markets are steady. We have a loyal customer base and our prices don't change with the price of commodities. Yes, our feed bills for the grain for the chickens and the pigs may go up and down a little bit, but in the seven years we've been doing this, we haven't seen a huge fluctuation. The other great thing is how many different hats that I can wear as a small farmer. I get to build things, repair things, watch things grow take care of the business side of things I get to be a salesman telling our customers about the way we do things and actually following that product that we grow through to the market and to its consumption with our customers is a very rewarding thing when I was in my old job I felt like one of the biggest consumers there ever was I was designing buildings and buildings are huge consumers of natural resources as a farmer I actually moved to the production side and so I'm making something I'm on the other side of the equation and that's very fulfilling for me especially when I can grow it in a way that benefits the natural world that grows better soil that doesn't contribute to climate change that keeps groundwater clean those are all things that I go to bed every night and I'm happy and um, I guess guilt-free about what I do because I know it's a it's a worthwhile wholesome and uh, activity that contributes to the benefit of the world if I had to sum up our business plan as a small farm and 
how we make a living off of it, it really falls to looking very closely at both sides of the equations, expenses and income. Probably if I had to prioritize them, I would say expenses are the first thing. You have to live really frugally. You have to be a jack of all trades. On the income side of things, you need to figure out how to produce a premium product. You need to sell that product effectively to customers, because after all, you're not the only one producing it. And you have to be able to charge a premium for that product. So, for those that are starting out in this business, I wish you all the luck. But remember, there's a lot you got to bring together for a small farm. And you have to be really dedicated to it. And you have to be a good financial manager. I hope that the way things we do here can help others who are thinking about starting a farm or maybe have already started a farm. And always, my email is open. Feel free to comment on this video if you have any questions. We've been around the horn enough times to know now what to do and what not to do. And I would love to be able to spread that information to others. Thanks. Have a good day. And I'll see you next time.